It's a cliche to say that a singer's personal life was like a country song, but for the legendary Tammy Wynette, it was literally true, as she used the turmoil of her failed marriages as fuel to create hit music. Here are tragic details about Tammy Wynette's life and loss. Tammy Wynette was born Virginia Wynette Pugh on her family's cotton farm in Itawamba County, Mississippi, in 1942. Her father died of a brain tumor when she was less than a year old, and her mother moved away to find work, leaving Pugh in the care of her grandparents. By the age of seven, she was working alongside her family picking cotton. She taught herself how to play her father's guitar, longing for a way out of her hard scrabble life. By 17, she had married, and by 20, she had two children. The poverty was, if anything, even worse than before. Her husband was often unemployed, and they lived in an abandoned log house with no amenities. As dramatized in the 1981 film Stand By Your Man, the stress caused a mental breakdown, which was treated with electroshock therapy. Later discussing the treatments, Tammy Wynette said, quote, They were horrible, but they helped me. In her late teens, Tammy Wynette's mother paid for her to go to beauty school when she became a licensed beautician. People Magazine reported that she told her skeptical classmates her dream of becoming a country music singer. One later remembered, she was lousy then, real twangy. I never in a million years thought that girl would amount to anything. Even after Wynette reached superstardom, she kept her beautician's license up to date for the rest of her life as a fallback in case her music career fizzled out. After earning her beautician's license, Wynette left her husband and moved to Birmingham, Alabama. There was one bright spot in her life as she began singing on the local television program The Country Boy Eddie Show for $30 a week, waking up at 4 in the morning to perform before her 10-hour shifts as a beautician. The show's host, Eddie Burns, told Wynette, The way you sing, you ought to go to Nashville. In 1966, despite a string of rejections from the country music industry, she followed his advice and moved to Nashville with no job, nowhere to live, and three small children to feed. Wynette's luck changed when she auditioned for producer Billy Sherrill at Epic Records, who liked her voice. Sherrill said that when he listened to her, quote, a little teardrop every now and then appears. He signed her and suggested she rename herself Tammy, as she resembled the character played by Debbie Reynolds in the movie Tammy. She was a hit almost immediately. In 1966, she recorded her first single, a cover of the Bobby Austin hit Apartment No. 9. It peaked at No. 44 on the Billboard Country Chart in January of 1967. In May 1967, her first album was released, and the title track, Your Good Girl's Gonna Go Bad, hit No. 3 on the Billboard Country Charts. By the end of the year, she had two number one country singles, My Elusive Dreams, a duet with David Houston, and her first solo number one song, I Don't Wanna Play House, which also earned her a Grammy for Best Female Country and Western Solo Performance. A year later, Wynette recorded the song that would become not only her signature song, but one of the most famous songs in all of country music. Wynette and Billy Sherrill co-wrote Stand By Your Man in just 15 minutes and released it in 1968. It was another number one hit on the Billboard Country Singles chart and crossed over onto the pop chart as well, peaking at number 19. It also earned her a second and final Grammy, although she would ultimately be nominated 12 more times over the course of her long career. The song was controversial from the start, in part because the record label explicitly positioned it as a conservative repudiation of the feminist movement. Epic released an advertisement that read, Tammy Wynette's answer to women's lib, stand by your man. Critics were not thrilled. Newsweek responded to the song by saying it was, quote, for the beleaguered housewife who grits her teeth as destiny dumps its slop on her head. The controversy over the song never truly went away, either. Wynette reportedly said, It's unbelievable to me that a song that took me 20 minutes to write, I've spent 20 or 30 years defending. The controversy continued right up to 1992, when then-aspiring First Lady Hillary Clinton, addressing the latest rumors about her husband's philandering, famously quipped, You know, I'm not sitting here as some little woman standing by my man like Tammy Wynette. Ironically, during the Stand By Your Man era, Tammy divorced her second husband, and in 1969 she married her third husband, country music star George Jones. The two met in a Nashville recording studio and got together after Jones declared his love for Wynette while she was literally in the middle of a fight with her second husband. They became an iconic country music couple, toured together as Mr. and Mrs. Country Music, had a daughter, 
country singer Georgette Jones, and recorded several chart-topping albums and duets together, such as We're Gonna Hold On and The Ceremony, in which they put their own wedding vows to music. Their marriage was stormy from start to finish, in part because of Jones' addictions to alcohol and cocaine. Wynette claimed that he once chased her with a rifle, and she described their dynamic as, quote, I was nagging and he was nipping. Despite divorcing after just six years, they continued working together regularly through 1980, and even made a reunion album and toured together in 1995. At one show, according to People, Jones introduced his ex-wife by announcing, I'm gonna bring out Miss Tammy Wynette now and see if we can get along for the first time in our lives. The 1970s were Tammy Wynette's golden age. Throughout her career, she had 20 number one hits and 39 top 10 Billboard country hits. The majority of these charted during the 70s, including Till I Can Make It On My Own, which she claimed was her favorite of her own songs. The song served as the title track of her first album recorded after her divorce from George Jones, and she shrewdly used the public's obsession with her personal life to fuel record sales. And her personal life remained dramatic. After her divorce from Jones, Wynette briefly dated fellow 70s icon Burt Reynolds and married Nashville real estate tycoon Michael Tomlin. The marriage lasted just 44 days. In 1978, Wynette married her fifth and final husband, George Ritchie, who worked as her manager for the rest of her career and with whom she co-wrote several songs, including, ironically, Till I Can Make It On My Own. She told People, I made a lot of mistakes, but thank God I finally got it right. But things weren't necessarily as rosy as they seemed. On a Fox radio podcast in 2017, daughter Georgette Jones described two separate 1976 incidents, one in which someone broke into their house and, quote, turned on every faucet, every sink, every bathtub, every shower in the entire house so the house was flooded. And there was another incident in which Georgette was sleeping in her mother's bedroom when that part of the house caught on fire and the entire back portion of the house we had to close off. It was completely burned, burned away. An even more bizarre incident took place in 1978. In a terrifying incident, Wynette claimed that she'd been abducted at gunpoint from a parking lot and that her kidnappers beat her and left her on the side of the road. Wynette gave interviews describing her ordeal in which she had visible bruises on her face and a fractured cheekbone. The identity of her kidnappers remained a mystery. Many years later, however, Wynette's daughter Jackie Daly wrote in her memoir that her mother had made it all up to cover up that her attacker had actually been her fifth husband. George Ritchie. Ritchie denied the allegations, but it would not be the last time he would face accusations from his stepdaughters regarding their mother. Wynette also dealt with other serious health problems throughout most of her adult life. According to Village's News, a hysterectomy after the birth of her fourth daughter left her with an infection that caused painful scarring and permanent intestinal symptoms. Around the same time, Wynette developed an obstruction in her bile ducts that damaged her gallbladder and caused further abdominal pain. She also endured multiple surgeries, including one on her kidneys, and her vocal cords when she developed nodules that needed removal. She often couldn't perform without first taking painkillers to manage the amount of pain her body endured, and at times she had to rely on backup singers to sing her parts. In 1986, she entered the Betty Ford Center to treat her addiction to painkillers, later telling People magazine, I never took cocaine or marijuana or even speed. I just needed something to ease pain. And stupidly, I just flat overdid it. In 1995, a near-fatal liver ailment sent her to the hospital again, about which she said, I was just that far from being dead. I had no pain. I wasn't scared. It was all just very peaceful. I felt like I was floating somewhere. Ironically, this painful experience caused some healing in her personal life. After not speaking for several years, George Jones visited his ex-wife in the hospital, and they resumed a friendship as well as a working relationship, which led to a reunion album and tour. In 1992, Tammy Wynette made an unexpected return to the Billboard Hot 100 by providing vocals for the song Justified and Ancient, Stand by the Jams, by British electronic duo The KLF. The KLF are notorious for such antics as announcing their departure from the music business in 1992 via a performance at the Brit Awards, during which they fired machine gun blanks into the audience. They later left a dead sheep on the steps of the hotel hosting an after-show party, burned a million pounds in cash, and deleted their entire music catalog for 30 years. According to Dangerous Minds, band member Jimmy Cotty suggested using Wynette on a song, and his partner Bill Drummond, a fan of Wynette and country music in general, agreed. 
he flew to Tennessee to meet with Tammy and ask her to collaborate. Drummond later called the project an evil and corrupt exchange, the young artist wanting to tap into the mythical status and credibility of the has-been, the has-been wanting some of that I'm still contemporary, relevant, will do anything to get back into the charts stuff. Nevertheless, Wynette called the experience, quote, the most rewarding thing I've ever done outside of country music, and fondly recounted making the music video for Entertainment Weekly. I was perched 50 feet in the air dressed as a queen, with a bunch of Zulu dancers around me, Japanese girls with long blonde wigs, and of course, Bill and Jimmy. On April 6, 1998, Wynette passed away in her sleep, at her home, at the age of 55. The cause of death was presumed to be a blood clot in her lung. Wynette worked right up until the end of her life. Her final concert appearance took place on March 5, 1998, when she filled in for ill fellow country music legend Loretta Lynn, while her final television appearance was four days later on the Nashville Network's primetime country. Publicist and friend Evelyn Shriver told People magazine, quote, She deserved an easy death. She had a tough life. Controversy followed Tammy Wynette even after she was no longer around to endure it. Per Country Living, Wynette's daughter Georgette Jones blamed her stepfather George Ritchie for her mother's untimely death, stating that by encouraging Wynette to overuse painkillers, he was indirectly responsible for her demise. She also claimed that he tried very hard to separate mom from her family and friends so he could be the only person she could turn to. I think she felt like she had no choice, and it was too difficult to fight. Three of Wynette's daughters filed a $50 million wrongful death lawsuit against Richie. According to CMT News, her body was exhumed and examined, with the results confirming Wynette had died of natural causes. Wynette's daughters dropped the lawsuit in 1999. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more grunge videos about your favorite stuff are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.